Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, British art, staycations and Robert Zemeckis. A new exhibition in London shows how Turner navigated turbulent times. We talk about coming full circle in the air. Grandma was a tough lady with a big heart. And little by little... She and how will the Witches remake compare to its much-loved predecessor? Turner is perhaps the first name that comes to mind when we think about British art. Many believe what distinguishes him from his contemporaries is how he responded to the major world events of his time and how he broke convention to do so. And this is exactly what Tate Britain highlights in their new exhibition. Hatice Maryam Gelger reports. Tate Britain is no stranger to William Turner. They boast the world's largest collection of Turner's Ur and they have previously put on shows to celebrate his depictions of tempestuous seas, turbulent wars, lush landscapes and steam trains. But this exhibition focuses on a different aspect of the romantic painter's work. We thought we would look at Turner as a painter who was unique in depicting of the modern world around him. He was living through a time of enormous change, transformation um, in Britain and Europe, a very turbulent period when there were the Napoleonic Wars with France, when at the same time there was industrial and technological development, the ongoing industrial revolution. Um, there were movements for political reform and social advance and social change. Um, issues of social justice were coming to the fore. Turner's early work was all about realistic imagery, with defined breaststrokes and bold colors, which was a reflection of his youth and energy. As a young painter, he would rigorously copy the works of French and Dutch masters, with the desire to become the greatest painter of his day. Over time, his canvases became more abstract and luminous. One might even argue that they became poetic. This is why many regard his late work as a predecessor to Impressionism, even though Monet's Impression Sunrise would be painted 20 years after Turner's death. So, what Turner did was revolutionary for his time. Not only for what he painted, but also how he painted. In the sense that he was an Impressionist, he was collecting his impressions rather than making an immediate impression in front of subject, something that's caught his eye in the way that the Impressionists did. So in that sense, he's still a painter of his time, you know, who, who was trained and um, taught to, to work in a certain way as an artist. What fascinated Turner above all else was, was, was atmosphere, it was light. As a painter of the modern world, he wanted to catch something of its volatility and turbulence. It's very important that he um, should focus on, um, on those atmospheric aspects because, of course, using those, he could create this kind of atmosphere of change and flux and constant movement and, and transition um, that spoke to the kind of subjects that he was, um, he was addressing. So he was a modern artist painting the modern world who, in a way, um, helped to invent modern art. Turner closely followed the technological advances of his time. One of his most famous works, Rain, Steam and Speed, is the first ever depiction of a steam train in oil paint. While some thought a train couldn't possibly be the subject of a painting, novelist William Makepeace Thackeray found it remarkable, saying the world has never seen anything like it. At the peak of his career, Turner created one of the most revered British paintings of all time, the Fighting Temeraire. Last February, the UK's Treasury put the image on its new £20 notes. The painting is celebrated not only because of its artistic quality, 
but also for what it stands for. You have um, a, a sailing battleship that had fought at Trafalgar that was a sort of heroic ship of the Napoleonic Wars that was sent to the breaker's yard because uh, you know, that's what happened to old ships. They were broken up so that their timber, their, their, their wood could be recycled for other things. She's being towed to the breaker's yard by a steam tug. So you have the past giving way to the present and you know, pointing into the future. But at the background, of course, you have this wonderful sunset, which suggests, you know, the it, something coming to an end. These small-scale studies, preparatory sketches, watercolors and large paintings show how Turner transformed the way he painted to better capture the changing world he lived in. Hatija Maryam Gyalgyor, TRT World, London. While the COVID-19 pandemic has reduced air travel to a record low, it also caused the birth of an unexpected trend, flying to nowhere. That might sound underwhelming, but it's giving staycations a whole new meaning. Departure Hong Kong. Destination Hong Kong. As the air traffic around the globe remains low, a new trend called flights to nowhere has taken off. During the golden hour, passengers of Hong Kong Express flew over some of the landmarks of the city for 90 minutes. I really miss the time when we could fly. It's been almost half a year that I haven't boarded a plane, and today I got this chance to fly. Although it's just an experience, anything is better than nothing. I'm very excited about it. The aviation industry has been suffering drastically, with many jobs at risk. To combat the impact of the pandemic, Airline companies in Japan and Taiwan have been offering flights to nowhere since August. Australia's Qantas Airways and Hong Kong Express have recently hopped on the wagon. Uh, we wanted to give people the opportunity to see what flying is like um, now that um, we're, we're in the pandemic and to see that it is a safe mode of travel and really to capture that pent-up demand that there is to get back up in the sky and um, many can't travel uh, beyond Hong Kong so this is a great alternative. Hong Kong Express has recently offered three nowhere flights for November. Tickets started at $50 and sold out in minutes. Obviously the pandemic is causing significant impact to many industries uh, and especially the airline industry and it's uh, extremely sad to see um, that many airlines are having to make cuts and, uh, and lose staff. And at Hong Kong Airlines, we, um, we're, we are as challenged as anybody, um, but we are taking uh, measures to, um, to really ensure that uh, we are ready. But is travelling to nowhere worth the environmental impact? Statistics show that air travel accounts for about 2.5% of all carbon emissions. And experts say air travel emission increased by more than 30% in five years prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, which was expected to triple by 2050. We do believe that these airlines having this project is creating unnecessary additional greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. Because like before, back then, flight meant to go somewhere. They had a purpose to bring people and cargoes to, from a place to another place. But this flight, they go from Hong Kong to Hong Kong, going nowhere. The original purpose of flying is lost. They're flying just for the sake of flying. So I think this is unnecessary, it's meaningless. Singapore Airlines had been hearing these concerns. The company recently called off their sightseeing flights following the backlash from environmental campaigners. But others will continue their flight plans and expect to bring customers back to the skies. Roald Dahl's book The Witches is a children's modern classic, and the 1990 movie adaptation got rave reviews. Now, 30 years later, director Robert Zemeckis tries his hand at a reboot, but how will it compare? Roald Dahl's novel The Witches tells the tale of a kid 
who, with the help of his grandmother, battles a coven of witches. In 1990, Nicholas Roque adapted the book for the big screen. The British director at the time was a frontrunner of art house cinema. He set his version of the witches in his home country and cast Angelica Houston for the lead role. Rogue was also known for his unique visual style. And to create a film in step with his aesthetic, he worked with master puppeteer Jim Henson, the brains behind The Muppet Show. Reviews say the movie captures the spirit of Dahl, thanks to Hansen's Creature Studio, Rogue's dark wit, and Lee Houston's performance. My story begins when I was a young boy. You'll be comfy here in your mama's old room. Now, 30 years later, Robert Zemeckis brings the witches back to the silver screen. It's the same story, offering a different experience. Rogue's film is called by media outlets as the scariest of scary children movies. And they count the dark atmosphere, the witch makeup, and eerie performances as the reason. On the other hand, Zemeckis' movie goes down a softer route. He's known for his visual spectacles like the Polar Express and the Back to the Future movies. He trades in Rogue's puppets for modern effects and animation. The Chicago native also reboots the setting. The story now takes place in Alabama in the 1960s. But the biggest difference Zemeckis brings to both the novel and the original film is its casting. In the age of Black Lives Matter, he turned the kid and his witch-battling grandmother into black Americans. But according to the media, the digital effects, the Hollywood sensibilities, and the colorblind casting may not be enough to help Zemeckis. IndieWire announces that The Witches is one of the director's most frustrating films because it feels like it could have been made by anyone. And then, the review delivers the final blow. Rogue's adaptation may have scarred a young generation for life, but at least they remembered it. You wouldn't happen to be carrying around a mouse on your person, now would you? A mouse? Mm -hmm. Why on earth would I be carrying around a mouse? Millennials are in their late 20s and mid-30s, and they're changing how art is being represented compared to their elders, Gen X. Nursen Atuter takes a look at how a museum in Berlin is highlighting these two contrasting styles. This is self-portraits as a clone of Jeanne d'Arc. Berlin's Hamburger Bahnhof Museum displays the works of American artist Bunny Rogers. Rogers was inspired by MTV's Clone High show, in which famous people were cloned and attended the same school. And the depictions are about a typical American teen at school. Though the cultural tools may be from the US, the general theme is the agony of growing up. She is interested in what happens in a person's biography during puberty. That time of high school, so around 13, 14 years old, you lose your carelessness of childhood. And you enter adulthood during a phase of insecurity and with the strong influence of the media events. Rogers, a millennial, was born in 1990. Her generation never knew life without the internet, and the museum wants to show how that shapes this group's distinctive voice. The identification that Bonnie Rogers has with the images from the media world 
are of course an experience that belongs to her generation. The younger visitors that come here will probably recognize some of the imagery easier than the people from my generation. I have to research, just like I have to research other cultural and historical content that concerns artists. Gabrielle Knapstein also adds that museums and art institutions have a responsibility to look at the new generation of artists and not just represent the already established names for the generations to come. Sotheby's just sold an Alberto Giacometti sculpture worth at least $90 million. And that's all we know because the bids were kept secret. But this could mean the Swiss artist now shares the top spot with Picasso as an auction favorite. Alberto Giacometti's sculptures are a big price under the hammer. And this one known as Grand Femme has been sold in a private sale by Sotheby's. The auction house set the starting price at $90 million and used a sealed and confidential best bid system. The nine-foot-tall sculpture is one of four made by the Swiss artist in 1960. This work is really the apotheosis of his exploration of the female standing figure over the course of his lifetime. Um, it's mesmerizing. Um, it places us in the artwork. How you encounter it and how it makes you feel is so much part of uh, the work and his intention. If it has been sold for more than 100 million, then Giacometti will equal Pablo Picasso as the artist with four works sold at the record-setting price or above. And it also contends with several other pieces on sale, such as Mark Rothko's Black on Maroon and Van Gogh's Flowers in a Vase. The auction is led by really post-war masterpieces. It's a, it's a trend that we've been seeing on the rise in, in terms of the market over the past several seasons. And a, an area of the market that we've, we at Sotheby's have really been focusing on is, is abstract expressionism. So you'll see the sale is led by key highlights by Mark Rothko, um, by other artists Clifford Still, Bryce Martin, um, through to Robert Ryman, Jean Dubuffet, and other great post-war masters. So, will the Giacometti sculpture tie Picasso's record? And will it be the big earner of the current round of Sotheby's sales? Well, unless the winning bidder reveals how much he or she paid for it, we might never know. Boniface Mwangi was outraged. His country, Kenya, broke out into violence after the elections in 2007 and 2008. It changed him from an activist to political candidate to a provider of change. And his journey has been documented in the award-winning film, Softy. Boniface Softy Mwangi was an outraged activist turned political candidate in Kenya. Now he's the star of a new award-winning Kenyan documentary, Softy which shines a spotlight on the country's battle with corruption. The film, which swept up awards at the Sundance and Durban Film Festivals, follows his evolution into politics. But between death threats, family turmoil and sending their children to safety in the US, it's ultimately a film about how a family can survive such pressure. Boniface says change can't happen alone. What I've learned in a very painful way during this entire process is that change is not an event. You don't have one event, and this change. It's a very slow, painful marathon. Kenya is East Africa's richest nation, but its booming economy has an ugly underbelly. Runaway corruption has trapped millions in poverty, extrajudicial police killings are common, and elections punctuated by deadly violence. Softy begins with Boniface outraged by the 2007 to 8 election violence. It documents his journey towards creating his own political party a decade later. <laughs> Njeri is his wife and fellow activist. By the time he was telling me that this is going to have a lot of my life, 
was very afraid. I was like, no, 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 that's not what we talked about. This is not, it can't be. But when you told me the importance of it and I saw what this really is doing for not just me, but the families of human rights defenders, of activists, I was like, okay, I want people to know what, that we exist. I want people to know that we struggle. I want people to know that our children really struggle. Filmmaker Sam Soko, who is an activist himself, said the film started out as a five-minute YouTube clip about organizing a protest. It sprawled into a seven-year project, now streaming on PBS in the United States and Britain's BBC. <laughs> When museums aren't displaying all their works, they put them in a warehouse. The old warehouse of Rotterdam's Boymans von Boeningen Museum was leaking, so they made a new one, but this time it's open to public and futuristic. No, it's not a museum or an art installation. This is a depot for Rotterdam's museum Boymans van Boeningen. From Dali to Rembrandt or Goya or Roman artworks and contemporary art pieces, this mirrored round building holds more than 150 artworks waiting to be displayed or restored. As well as its function and artistic appeal, the depot also allows visitors. You can book a tour and discover some behind the scenes of museum going. And the, these guides know uh, per day what the activity is in the depot. And so there could be a conservator at work, there could be very interesting transport that comes in, and there could be ma many things going on, or you can just enjoy uh, hanging around and looking what people do, because you see 40 people at work taking care of the collection. The 40 metre tall building has a smaller base than its roof. It's to reduce the footprint, the architect Bwini Maas explains. The rooftop also houses a small forest of 75 birch trees that used to be on the ground level. To make them stronger, they intertwined their roots. The mirrored shell and the green rooftop were designed to blend in with the park that surrounds the building. They also wanted to compensate for the space the depot occupies in the park. How to make a building that somehow loves the park, that people are going to love and where the facility invites people to come in. That you make a, a compensation of the park by planting the, the, the roof forest on top of it and then last but not least to clad it with mirrors so that you make the park visually better and as a side effect you mirror yourself and the city and you get into this kind of reflective mode. Come next year, people can also store their own art in the depot. Mars thinks the real charm of the building is in its mystery. The chance of seeing artworks laying around waiting to be admired. Here you have to, to be inspired by yourself somehow, or by the surprises that are there, the non-choreography, the opening the door act, the sliding the, uh, the storage element and, element and to find out that, that Monet is hanging next to a, a gorgeous amateur piece. I think that kind of combinations that you never could have designed is what this is about a little bit. The museum's director described the building to the Guardian as a treasure chest. There are five different climate zones for the needs of different artworks that are worth millions of dollars and you can watch how an art shipment happens in real life. A first in its field, the depot is considered to be the future of art warehouses, as London's Victorian Albert is said to have been considering a similar move for their own collection. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfide Kitti, thanks for watching. Bye for now.